What a joyful morning. What a blessing to be back here. It's been so long. We have missed you sitting here, as Father said, in this empty church, trying to see you in the middle of the lens of the camera. And I'm so happy we can be here together. Can I get an hallelujah from the crowd? Amen. Praise Jesus! Praise Jesus! But I'd like to give us one word of caution in that let's make sure that our joy doesn't turn into triumphalism, the ugly cousin of joy. Triumphalism has an arrogance to it. It's the type of things that makes us taunt people, have a sense of victoriousness. But this is not what Jesus calls us to. Jesus calls us to genuine joy, and genuine joy is humble, as Christ is humble. So let us not fall into the trap of triumphalism. We can be joyful. We can be happy. We can think this is absolutely the right decision without falling into triumphalism. The first reading today actually gives us a little insight into the idea that the problem we're having now is not a new problem. Hansen's disease, which was called leprosy in the past, turns out not to be a whole lot like what the Jews thought when they wrote today's first readings and the associated laws. It turns out that hygiene and cleanliness are far more important to fighting leprosy or Hansen's disease than quarantine and isolation. It's a bacterial infection. It also turns out that people can be contagious even when they're not showing symptoms. And so, again, isolation only when you have symptoms doesn't prevent the spread as much as they would like. But the Jews didn't know that, and so they did the best that they could with what they knew. And so we have the same choice that a Jew 3,000 years ago could have, who might be a little suspicious that the rules being asked of us may not be perfect. We can go down the road of being indignant and angry and frustrated and thinking of our own self-interests. Or we can take a far more loving, charitable approach, even when we're not so sure the things are being done right. Because our politicians carry a heavy burden of making very difficult decisions of balancing public health interests and the freedoms that our country deserves. It is not easy. And when things are not easy, even good-intentioned people can make the wrong decisions. So let's avoid triumphalism. Let's be humble. Let's pray for our leaders that they have wisdom and prudence. This choice, though, that we have of deciding whether we are going to take an attitude of frustration and anger and self-interest or whether we will take an attitude of selflessness and love is actually something Jesus goes through in today's gospel passage. Now, he didn't have a problem with the illness because he could heal any illness he wanted like that. So someone had leprosy, that wasn't a problem for him. He had the problem of overwhelming fame. And whenever he healed somebody, the crowds would grow and become overwhelming. It hurt his ministry that he intended. And so he had to make the choice. If he was going to be selfish and, and focused on his needs, or whether he was going to be selfless and compassionate to the person who needed to be healed. And obviously, we know what he chose. As the Gospel tells us today, he was moved with pity, as he so often was. And he chose selfless love. 
love. You know, when we talk about love in these sorts of terms, most people, I think, get it. We get that love is selfless. It's something we give that requires action, determination, follow through. When we talk about Christ's love for us, we get love. When we talk about our love for our children, we get love. But somehow when Valentine's Day or similar rolls around, I think sometimes we get a little confused as to what love is. We see it in more of a sense of receiving as opposed to giving. Things like not quite getting the gift we wanted this morning hurts us. But trust me when I say the greatest romantic love is exactly like the love that God has for us and the love that we have for our children. It is selfless. You know, at weddings, we often hear the, the passage from 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, all these things. But I think when people hear it at weddings, including the bride and the groom, they often aren't really listening to what those words are telling us. What they hear is, this means that my spouse needs to be kind and patient with me. Not so much a command to ourselves, towards our spouse. And don't get me wrong, I think even people who view it that way, they're not afraid of returning the favor. It's not that they think, oh, I only want to receive, I don't want to give. But for a lot of these people, it starts in a place of receiving. The root is receiving, and then we respond. But I ask you, did Christ love us because we loved him first? Do, our children, do we love our children because they love us first? Is Christ's love conditional on our response? Is our love for our children conditional on their response? No, of course not. But how often... Does that, still, does that still happen to us when we put it in a romantic context? And so perhaps maybe if you fear that the box of chocolates you got this morning wasn't quite the right decision, I have a solution that we can maybe take the next step to having healthier, better marriages and make this a wonderful Valentine's Day. It doesn't mean going to the store and getting yet the next bigger box or add a teddy bear or anything like that. It means making a profound promise to our spouses. So I printed something up. Two sides to it, one for a husband, one for a wife. Because we're not handing out papers now, unfortunately, you have to go to my website, deaconken.org, go to the blog section or just slash blog and you'll get there. But it'll be on the top of the page. And it is a marriage recommitment form. I'll read the husband one. The wife one is almost identical. And it says, I blank desire, so Ken Crawford, I, Ken Crawford, desire to recommit myself to the principles of Catholic marriage and to my wife, another blank, Wendy Crawford. I promise to never question the permanence of our marriage. I commit to forgiving and forgetting any pain my wife has caused me, past, present, and future. I promise to pray for my wife's needs and the needs of our marriage and family. I rededicate myself to a life of serving my wife. I pray that the fruit of our marriage will be both life-giving and life-affirming. This I promise on the 14th day of February, 2021. 
This is the type of thing we can do for our spouses on Valentine's Day that will be far more meaning and carry far more weight than any box of chocolates or teddy bear or flowers or whatever is traditional. Not that those things are bad. My wife got a box of chocolates this morning and a huge Hershey kiss because I love big kisses. But that's not the core, is it? The core is the love. And love is something we give, not something we receive. And so I wish you all a blessed and selflessly loving Valentine's Day and that your marriages be joyful for the rest of your lives.